Hi students, welcome. Let's take some notes on compounds and the octet rule. Get out your science notebook and write the essential question at the top of the page. Why do atoms bond? This is gonna take an in-depth understanding of a few things in order to answer this question to the fullest extent. We'll start with elements. We've learned about elements. In fact, we've been learning about the periodic table of elements. An element is a substance that's just made from one type of atom. Here, for example, we have on the left side, this gas, which is bromine gas. If we had some powerful microscopes, we could maybe look at the atoms of bromine and see that this substance is made from just bromine elements. On the right side, we have iron, a bar of iron. And again, if we were able to look very closely at the atoms, we can see that it's just iron atoms that make up this iron substance. So these are both made of elements. Contrasting that is compounds. This is what we're learning new for this unit. A compound is a substance made from two or more different types of elements that are chemically bonded. Now that's really important. These elements have to be chemically bonded. They can't be separated. For example, you're probably familiar with water. You probably know that water is H2O. Well, that's a compound. That means that we have hydrogen and oxygen molecule or elements that are combined together to make a water molecule. So here in this distilled water jug, we have water molecules floating around. On the right side, we have carbon dioxide. That's one carbon and two oxygens attached. And in that smoggy gas, we see a bunch of those little particles floating around. Now, there are other particles there as well, but we're just focusing on the carbon dioxide. Now, as for compounds, we're going to be learning about two major types this unit. One is ionic compounds, and the other type is covalent compounds. Let's look at the compound formulas again, just to make sure we understand what we're looking at here. On the left, we have CO with a little two, that's carbon dioxide. What that means is there's one carbon and there are two oxygens. The subscript next to elements let, let us know how many elements there are, and all of these compounds are combined together chemically to make a substance. In the middle, we have sodium sulfide, or that's two sodiums and one sulfur attached. The little two, the subscript, is right after the sodium. Lastly, we have sodium chloride. There's no subscript, so we can just assume that there's one of each. All right, the octet rule is a very important rule in chemistry. This is, lets us know why atoms bond. Atoms bond because they want to react and bond with each other in order to obtain a full valence. This is called the octet rule. Now, a full valence, if you think about drawing Bohr models, the most any element can have on its outer shell, on its valence shell, is eight electrons. So for most elements, a full valence is eight electrons. Now, there are some exceptions across the periodic table. Two notable ones that you should know are hydrogen and helium. They only need two. The reason for that, if you remember, when we drew Bohr models, the very first ring can only hold two electrons, and hydrogen and helium only have one ring. There are different ways elements get to an octet. And that leads us back to ionic compounds and covalent compounds. So let's explore those a little bit further. Before we do that, you need to remember which elements are metals, which are nonmetals, and which are metalloids on the periodic table. I have a little periodic table in the lower left-hand corner for you to view. If you notice, everything on the left side of the metalloid stair step are metals except for hydrogen. Everything on the right side of the metalloid stair step are nonmetals. And don't forget to include hydrogen in that well, when we look at ionic compounds, they can follow the octet rule because metals will lose electrons to nonmetals. The nonmetals will take those electrons, and so every element will eventually be able to get their octet, and they'll combine together to do so. Covalent compounds are a little bit different. Covalent compounds are made only of nonmetals, and so nonmetals share electrons with other nonmetals in order for them to get a full octet. Now, in both cases, electronegativity plays an important role, so we're going to explore that with two examples. Let's start with an ionic compound. Here's an octet example. Here we have two Bohr models, one of sodium and one of chlorine. If you take a look, we want to figure out what's the easiest way for these elements to get an octet. Well, remember, sodium has a low electronegativity. Electronegativity is the tendency of an element to be attracted to electrons. So sodium isn't very attracted to electrons. 
Chlorine, on the other hand, has a high electronegativity. It really wants electrons. And so here, one atom is willing to give up its electrons. It's not attracted. And the other one is really wants more electrons. So you can kind of figure out what's going to go, go on here. We have our metal giving an element, or giving an electron to our non-metal. So these elements now both have an octet. See, chlorine took that electron from sodium. Now, sodium, because of its low electronegativity, loses that negative electron, which means that sodium has one less electron than normal. If you remember when we talked about ions, this means that sodium is now charged. It's an ion. In fact, we call it a cation or positively charged. Now, what about its full valence? It just lost an electron. Well, take a look at sodium. By losing that electron, it loses its outer energy level, and it goes to the next highest energy level, which is full. It gained an octet. Now, chlorine, being high electronegativity, gains that negative electron. Because it gains an extra electron, it has a change of charge. In fact, now it's negatively charged. It becomes an anion. Now, it also gains a full valence because now its outer shell has a full amount, or eight electrons. These two elements are now attracted to each other because of those charges. Remember, opposites attract. And this is the main concept behind ionic compounds. This is the formula for sodium chloride, as we saw before. Now, typically, when we draw the octet, when we draw sodium and chloride interacting in an ionic compound, we don't typically use Bohr models to do that because it gets really complicated. Instead, we use electron dot structures. Here's a simplified version of what we just saw. Sodium with one valence electron will lose its valence to chlorine, which will gain it. Sodium will become positive one, chlorine will become negative one, and now you can see how the two will interact. All right, let's take a look at a covalent compound octet. So here, what's the easiest way for these non-metal elements to form an octet? Remember, nitrogen has a high electronegativity. It's in the upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. It does not want to give away its electrons. It wants, it's very attracted to them. Now, hydrogen is also a non-metal. It also has a high electronegativity. It's not really willing to give up electrons. So what are these guys going to do? Well, as we saw before, these guys are going to share electron. Hydrogen shares one electron each with nitrogen, and it's going to gain a full octet. Now remember, for hydrogen, an octet is two electrons. It's happy enough with two electrons, although most others want eight. Nitrogen, on the other hand, will share one with each of the different hydrogens, so we will also get an octet. If you count all the valence electrons around it right now, it's sharing a total of eight. All elements now have an octet. This is the covalent compound formula for this covalent compound NH3. None of these elements, by the way, became ions. Because they're not gaining or losing electrons, technically, they don't ever become charged. So we're not writing charges here. They're sharing electrons and double dipping on those electrons. All right, that leads us to the end of our notes. Take a moment and review and highlight key terms. Ponder and ask any questions you might have, and don't forget to seek answers to those questions. Finally, you might want to take some time to summarize and answer that essential question with some detail. All right, good luck.